Hello and welcome to this video on finding the highest common factor and lowest common multiple of two numbers. Now in a previous video we saw how to find the factors and multiples of a number. So if we had these two numbers 6 and 8, well the factors of 6 are the numbers that divide into 6, the numbers that go into 6. So well, 1 is a factor 6 and if 1 is a factor then 6 is as well because 1 times 6 is 6. Is 2 a factor? Yes, 2 goes into 6, and 2 times 3 is 6, so 3 must also be a factor, and then we've listed all the factors. What about 8? The factors are 1 and 8, because 1 times 8 is 8, and 2 times 4 also give 8, and 3 is not a factor of 8. What about multiples? Now remember that a multiple of 6 is just a number that 6 goes into, so effectively the 6 times table. So 6 would be a multiple of 6 because it's 1 times 6, you've got 2 times 6, 3 times 6, 4 times 6, etc. And then with 8 we've got 1 times 8, 2 times 8, 3 times 8, 4 times 8, etc. Now what it means to have a common factor of these two numbers is a factor which is well common to both. But what factor do they both have in common? Well they both have a common factor of 1 and in fact 1 is a common factor of any two numbers because 1 is a factor of every whole number. Uh, well 2 is a common factor but we don't have any other common factors. So we'd say that the highest common factor, i.e. the common factor which has the greatest value, would be 2. So the highest common factor, or HCF for short, would be equal to 2. And the lowest common multiple is basically the number which is the smallest common multiple of both of these numbers. So what multiple is common to both these lists? Well, we can see, look, they have 24 in common, and that's the smallest number. So we'd say the lowest common multiple, or LCM for short, is 24. So we can see that one way to find the highest common factor and lowest common multiple of two numbers is to just list their factors and list some of their multiples uh, and see what the highest number is or the lowest number is in common. Let's do another example where we use that same method and then we'll see an alternative method which uses the prime factorization of the numbers. So if we had 10 and 15, well the factors of 10, well we've got 1 and 10 and we've got 2 times 5, and there's no other factors. And what about the 15? Well, we've got 1 times 15, and we've also got 3 times 5, and there's no other factors. And, in, and if we want multiples, we've got 10, 20, 30, 40, etc. basically the 10 times table. And with 15, we've got 15, 30, 45, 60, etc. So, what factors do they have in common? Well, they have one in common for sure, um, but they also have five in common, and that is the highest common factor. So the HCF would be five. And then the lowest common multiple, well, what do they have in common? Well, they have 30 in common, and that is the smallest common multiple. We'd also have 60 on both lists, but 30 is the smallest one, so the smallest common multiple is 30. And I, by the way, I tend to just list the multiples of the larger number, in this case a 15, until I see a multiple of the smaller number. So I'll, I'll illustrate that with the next example. Let's say we've got 18 and 24. Now a quick trick, by the way, if we're trying to find the highest common factor, whatever it is has to also be a factor of the difference between the two numbers. So the difference between 18 and 24 is 6, so whatever the highest common factor is has to be a factor of 6. Well, 6 itself is a factor of 18, and it's a factor of 24, and so it's just going to be 6. But we could just use the same method of listing out all the factors. But that's a neat little trick. The highest common factor goes into the difference of the two numbers. And what about the lowest common multiple? Well, as I said, let's just list out the uh, multiples of the larger number first. So, uh, the multiples of 24, we get, well, 24 itself. Is that a multiple of 18? No. What's the next multiple of 24? Well, add another 24, we get 48. Is that a multiple of 18? No. So let's add another 20, we get 72. Is that a multiple of 18? Yes, it is. So that must be the lowest common multiple. So the lowest common multiple is 72. 
And by the way, a neat little trick, which I bet most teachers don't even know, if you multiply the highest common factor and the lowest common multiple, so if I multiply those together, so we get 6 times 72, that gives us 432. Now, what happens if we multiply the two original numbers together? 18 times 24. Ah, 18 times 24 also gives you 432. So basically, the product of the highest common factor and the lowest common multiple is also the product of the two original numbers. And the way we can use that is, let's say that we knew that the highest common factor was 6, then what we could do is we could do the product of the two numbers, so 18 times 24, and then when we divide it by the highest common factor, 6, that gives us 72, which is the lowest common multiple. So that's a neat little trick to find the lowest common multiple. Now for the next question, I'm going to use a slightly different approach, which works better with larger numbers. Now what you do is you find the prime factorization of each of the two numbers first. So we explored that in a previous video. 60 is uh, well, 15 times 4, for example. It doesn't matter how you split it up. Um, nine of these are primes. So we have to split them further. 15 is 3 times 5. Both of them are prime, so we can circle them, and then we can stop there once we get to a prime number. These are like the leaves of this tree. Um, 4 is, well, 2 times 2. They're both prime, so we can circle them, and we can stop because we're now at the leaves. What about 54? Well, 54 is 9 times 6. Uh, neither prime. 9 is 3 times 3. And 6 is 3 times 2. And that means that 60 is, well, 2 squared times 3 times 5. Remember that we just multiply all the leaves, the circle numbers together. So we've got two twos, so that's 2 squared, meaning 2 times 2. We've got a 3 and a 5 multiplied together. Whereas 54 is 2 times 3 cubed. Now here's where the magic happens. If we just write those lined up with each other, so we've got 60 is 2 squared times 3 times 5. And we've got 54 is. Now make sure you line these up. So if we have a prime factor of 2, it's in line with the other prime factor of 2. So we've got 2 there, times by 3 cubed. So that has to line up with the 3 above it, 3 cubed. Now, if we want to find the highest common factor, I call it wins and what loses method. What we do is we see what loses out of these two prime factors here. What loses out of 2 and 2 squared? Well, this 2 has a lower power, that's effectively a power of 1. So that loses, so, so we just keep the 2 to the 1, or just 2. Now, what loses out of 3 and 3 cubed? Well, that's smaller than that, so that loses, so we just take the 3. And what loses out of 5 and nothing? Well, nothing will always lose against something, so we don't have anything at all. And then we have 2 times 3, which is just 6. Now, with the lowest common multiple, you can probably guess what's coming up here. We see what wins. So what wins out of 2 squared and 2 to the 1? Well, it's 2 squared. What wins out of 3 cubed and 3? Well, it's 3 cubed. And what wins out of 5 and nothing? Well, it's 5. And then if we multiply those together, we've got 4 times 27 times 5, and that gives us 540. So I call that the what wins, what loses method. It's just a name I made up. It's not an actual mathematical name. And the reason it works is because when you're finding a common factor, basically, the highest power of 2 will be common to both because, well, 2 to the 1 divides into 2 to the 1, and 2 to the 1 divides into 2 squared. So it's common to both of these things here. And similarly, the lowest common multiple, you see what wins because both 2 squared and 2 to the 1 divides into 2 squared. That's why it works. Let's use the same method here. Now, sometimes if the exam question is generous, they actually give you the prime factorization of these numbers. So we've got 1, 2, 6 is equal to 2 times 3 squared times 7. And then we've got 600 is equal to 2 cubed. So it's got to line up with that 2. We've got times 3. That can line up with that 3. And then we've got times 5 squared. Now, that's a 7. We don't want the 5 to be under it, so we have to create a new column for the 5 squared. It doesn't matter that these are not in ascending order. And then we can apply the what wins, what loses method. So the highest common factor, we see what loses. So 2 and 2 cubed, what loses? 2. 3 and 3 squared, what loses? The 3. 7 and nothing, what loses? Nothing. 
nothing in phi squared, what loses nothing. So in fact, I shouldn't have had that times. And two times three is again six. And what about the lowest common multiple? What wins out of two cubed and two? Two cubed. What wins out of three squared and three? Three squared. What wins out of seven and nothing? Seven. And what wins out of five squared and nothing? Five squared. So if we multiply those together, we get eight times nine times seven times 25 is 12,600. And we could always uh, use that trick where we multiply the highest common factor and the lowest common multiple. So if we do 6 times 1,200, we get 75,600. And if we multiply the original numbers together, we also get 75,600. So we must have got it right. Now you might think, what is the point of this? Why would we want to find the highest common factor, lowest common multiple? Well, we've got this applied example here, and this is quite common to GCC papers. Uh, the K3 and K4 bus both come at 9 a.m. The K3 comes every 12 minutes, and the K4 every 16 minutes. At what time do they next arrive together? Well, if you think about it, they both come at 0 minutes past 9. Let's say this is the K3 and this is the K4. And well, the K3, if it comes every 12 minutes, then it comes at multiples of 12. So it will come 12 minutes later, it will come 24 minutes later, it will come 36 minutes later, 48 minutes later, etc. And the K4, starting at 0 minutes past 9, it comes every 16 minutes. So it will come at 16 minutes later, 32 minutes later, multiples of 16 here, 48 minutes later, 64 minutes later, etc. Now, can you see that they'll arrive at the same time if they're both the same amount of time past nine o'clock? So we can see if 48 minutes have passed, both of the buses come at the same time. And can you see that 48 is just the lowest common multiple of 12 and 16? So basically 48 minutes would have passed and therefore it must be 9.48 a.m.